and the appointment and employment, <coughs> excuse me, unemployment status of insurance and contractors. That work is currently ongoing and will be reported to the Assembly upon completion. Members are requested to note the call and happy to take any questions. No, okay, so the, 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 the recommendation has been noted before, but can I just make two points maybe before we start? Um, I stand to be corrected if I'm wrong about this man, but my understanding is that our professional officers were the first to notice that there wasn't anything in the that was a problem. Um, I don't think there any cause for concern. And I would want us to go um, further into the item without mentioning that Councillor Gilchrist, um, he was a little on the go in this, but Councillor Gilchrist did express concern to me early on, uh, suggesting that perhaps there should be a special meeting for this committee and possibly of uh, uh, appointment appointments as well. So um, people would have come to this, but the reason we didn't meet uh, earlier was that, uh, in my judgment, it would premature when the investigations were still going on to call this meeting, particularly as it was already scheduled to take place tonight, and I felt that there was sufficient time for us to, uh, to deal with it fully this evening. So you can come back on that if you want to do, but then you get to the assembly. Well, I'm thinking carefully, I suppose, because as I've sent you sets of emails to members of this committee, where I've made inquiries about assertions that were made about the gentleman's business in another council, uh, and where it had been reported that the council chief executive had had discussions with the chief executive of that other council about certain matters. And so um, there had been, shall we say, interest is the safest way to describe it, in trading arrangements that the gentleman had. Um, and therefore, I'm, I'm somewhat troubled, but anxious, because when I looked at the number of interims and consultants reported to the business committee on the 28th of November, uh, there was like 46 that passed through the council's arrangements over two years or so, and it struck me that there aren't such a great number that we can't keep an accurate check on them. Uh, I think. If I was making a general comment here, yeah, is that because people are used to working with certain individuals and become close to them, shall we say, that perhaps some caution isn't uh, exercised. And so we can't risk, in any case, becoming too close to any of our contractors. We always have to be diligent and careful and make sure proper procedures are followed. So before I dig any legal holes from yourself, I'll shut up. Very careful. Thanks. Um, I, I'll be honest, I'm a bit disappointed with this report, um, to be honest. And, the, and, and probably the reason, and I'm pleased someone did consult you about whether we should have a, a, a special meeting, but it certainly wasn't on the comms plan, so I presume that's another, was it Kev? So that's, I presume that's another factor um, that was taken into account. Just looking at, as I say, I think it's disappointing. I think the uh, the responses are disappointing because it fails to capture, in my mind, one of the, the big issues, which we're told that um, a, a person in the payment office uh, found this on the, I think it was the 19th, it says on the 19th of January, was it? Uh, they found it. And yet, on the, I've got it here, again, this is all public record, FOI, FOI, but on the 24th of January, um, Eric Robinson, the Chief Executive, wrote to Phil and to my leader, Ian Lewis, uh, saying, um, thriving local economy, robust plan, outstanding programme events, tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. To make sure we have the best chance of success, I have asked Stuart Halliday to take the lead on these important areas. For the council, Stuart has been instrumental in leading the creation of a real growth company, which we do over five million dollars. Oh, this is money. Stuart will assume the job title of corporate director for economic and housing growth. 
which was recently vacated by Brian Bailey. Obviously, that's another story. While this is not a permanent formal appointment, Shield will work with us on an interim basis. I have agreed he will take the lead in this position while we deal over all the priorities I have outlined. Now, if the, uh, the person in finance um, who was um, astute enough to identify this issue with the uh, my understanding is, off the back of that, my leader uh, made a quick search of um, company's house, company house record, and again identified that um, the company that was being taken on had in fact been wound up, but nonetheless we were paid and, and so Rose got a whole series of the payments that hadn't hadn't been made. So it's it strikes me that there is a bit of an issue here. One of the things that um, that Mark makes a considerable play of every time I point out and it actually it's brought out in one of the meetings identified on the 25th of January. <coughs> where the, a meeting was called to discuss the findings of internal audit review. And all the people at that meeting, from what I can work out, all worked for the Corporate Director for Business Management. Uh, so everybody in that entire meeting that was discussing what had been going on here worked in a single director. And I think one of the reasons I've raised that point before about my concerns, and one of the points Mark has made in the past, is that that's okay because he has direct opportunity to go to the chief executive. And yet, internal audit officers here have been engaged to check what was going on on 16th of January, that they had been engaged, and yet on the 24th of January, the chief exec made the appointment of Mr. Halliday um, to an interim position within the authority. Now that suggests either our systems are particularly robust because no one told the chief executive and therefore he went out and appointed him. Or people did know and it just <coughs> <some of> his, <coughs> or whatever it was. Uh, they weren't he wasn't told. So strikes me the chief executive should have known that he didn't know there's there are some issues that fall apart, including, in my opinion, the fact that everybody all works for one directorate which didn't allow that one presumes that was all kept within the directorate rather than going further out. And the other thing that the report doesn't highlight, in my opinion, <coughs> is <coughs> when IR35 came in, which I think, um, broadly speaking, was what the Chancellor introduced a couple of years ago to stop contractors <coughs> uh, avoiding paying income tax because, of course, they set themselves up as a company and end up paying corporation tax instead of uh, paying uh, income tax. Was that, uh, so I checked with uh, the then acting director of finance and said, are we IR35 compliant? And one of the key points that was raised to me is absolutely because all our contractors and interims are on payroll. So they all get their money from the council via its payroll. So whatever they're on, that's how they're paid. Now I notice that in this instance, and maybe there are some others I don't know, that that policy seems to have changed. And we're now in a position of policy or protocol or having one described it has changed. And we're now in a position where we are uh, paying the companies for the service of contractors. And what I don't see in this report is a suggestion that that should be stopped. Because for me, if we're going to bring in a contractor, or an interim director, and so on and so forth. That should be paid from by the payroll, so we know that all the appropriate levels of tax are being collected, not through umbrella companies and this sort of company and that sort of uh, matrix and this and that and the rest of it. We should make sure the contractors are on our payroll and they pay the right amount of tax. And I don't see that as a recommendation coming out of this report which I find really surprising. So the official question that that was a position that was not being done Well, and it's a combination. It's a why isn't that included? It's a, it can, I can turn that into a recommendation for you if you like, that we should, we should go to that position 
but also my concern about, I suppose I'd like an answer for, why on earth was the Chief Executive appointing uh, Mr Halliday on the 24th, when apparently we knew about this on the 16th, and why was there only a, a gathering of the wagons, from what I can tell, on the 25th, after Councillor Lewis, Councillor Ian Lewis, had done his own research and sent a note to, uh, to the monitoring officer on the 24th. So <coughs> there's a range of questions in there. Uh, in relation to the, uh, the appointment of uh, an employment status of the insurance and contractors, you'll notice this recommendation 5. Uh, it just says you're going to review them, Mark. It doesn't say this is what they should be. The, the purpose of this report was to identify the circumstances in relation quite specifically to the VAT issue as came to light in uh, January, as you point out. We've established that, that uh, procedures were followed, however, we find ourselves as an organisation in a position where we've been making payments like, uh, to a company that wasn't properly registered for VAT purposes. Having established that, having identified that, that there are a number of actions that need to be taken with immediacy in relation to stopping any further engagement with this company, notifying HRMC. <laughs> we then go on to say that having reported upon that partner, we feel there's a need for more targeted, more comprehensive pieces of work to be undertaken on the verification of VAT subscriber and the first numbers and the appointment of an employment status of insurance and contractors, at which point we would delve deep as we are doing at this moment in time into the IR35 position into In relation to the I'm just issues. switching it off for a while. I thought you were asking for that. In relation to the meeting that took place on the 25th of January, um, the reason that the individuals identified there were gathered around that table was because there were a number of statutory officers. The Section 15 officer needed to be in attendance, the monitoring officer needed to be in attendance. Uh, it was at that point that we were reporting in a, uh, an interim way. Like, uh, what we've managed to establish thus far in relation to uh, an issue that was reported to us. We needed to alert those officers as to whether or not there was any substance to the allegations, the nature of it, so, and what actions we subsequently needed to take, which are subsequently incorporated within this report. So this report, I accept that and it isn't a, a, a fully comprehensive evaluation of every single aspect of this. The time to get it was such that, that we weren't able to do that, but Smaller recommendations specifically deal with the need for us to undertake further more detail about it in the two areas of this report. But if I may, just yeah. what that doesn't deal with is why if we knew about this on the 16th, which we're being told in this report, we must know about it on the 16th at a senior level, why the chief executive made the appointment on the 24th, wrote to my leader Ian Lewis and Phil Gilchrist saying that he was making that appointment. So how did that happen? And it's all very well having a meeting on the 25th, but it's all, don't senior officers talk to each other? Didn't anyone kind of warn the chief executive that this was going on? It's either, as I say, you know, it's either he didn't know and he shouldn't know, he shouldn't know, or, you know, someone hasn't bothered to tell the chief executive before he made this appointment. And the other thing I would say, and I'm prepared to, to move it if I get a second there, that following on from this particular report, uh, we believe as a committee that interims and contractors should be engaged with the council on an on-payroll basis and not through, uh, through companies, third-party companies, etc. Jeff, you're raising quite a number of different points. Good. We slightly overlap. But your fundamental point really is a question we've directed to the Chief Executive and he's not even to answer it. Well, maybe I can ask, there's, there's a number of people who were at the meeting, ask them whether they would spoken to the Chief Executive about it prior to the Chief Executive, well, from, if we knew on the 16th whether anyone had bothered to tell the Chief Executive about this issue prior to him making the appointment. I mean, you made your point, you can share it, would you like to say more? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I knew about it on the 24th of January, um, and then the Chief Executive knew about it on the 25th of January. He didn't know before. Um, there was a gap in between.
between finding out that um, the company was dissolved and um, me being informed. Now, I have addressed that with um, various people and uh, that will happen again. But I think it was just in terms of uh, some of the staff who were, involved, who were involved in that weren't, some were senior, some weren't very senior. They didn't perhaps um, realise that this needed to be escalated immediately to the chief executive. And also there was issues of availability. Um, so it was just an error on, I guess, my part that um, my staff hadn't informed me by that time. So, Chairman, we'll have to wrap to address both questions. So, um, as you say, as someone who was there as part of that conversation, that, that there is an element of disjoint, of course, between um, the finance staff noticing that there's an issue uh, with VAT and company registration, and particularly they were looking at the VAT in terms of a company over there and over here the Chief Executive making an appointment of an individual who was not to be appointed through the company, but actually through what you, uh, I'll come on to this, uh, will call payroll. So they were quite distinct processes. And, and, and as said, one of the things at that meeting was uh, ourselves questioning uh, how this has bubbled up through processes from the 16th to the 24th, but actually working days isn't that long a period uh, in isolation. And of course when we contacted HRC and they said, well actually this you're already doing this in a much quicker way than most organisations would. So uh, this is simply due uh, or less senior staff not going to be together maybe quite in, in a way that will create something as instantaneous as that. This is you know, over a short space of days, uh, and as you'll see there, as soon as uh, I was contacted and the chair was contacted, we very quickly organised the meeting and acted within hours of that meeting. Now, in terms of on the payroll, I declare interest, of course, because I was uh, a, a contractor here, uh, and was not on the payroll. Um, in, in as much as not directly paid by the council through the council's PAYE systems. Uh, contractors and locals are paid through what's called matrix. Uh, and that is maybe perhaps what you're uh, confusing your understanding as on the payroll as opposed to directly employed. And all such contractors, uh, one of the first questions asked always is, is it IR35 or, uh, or not? Uh, because that alters the day rate in the circular round of money uh, and uh, all of those people to be compliant with that are 35 or almost always equally through a personal service company or through an umbrella company. I, for example, acted through an umbrella company and an agent uh, to go through that process. Uh, and that, of course, was a change a couple of years ago when IR35 all that came in some time ago was a relationship between <coughs> Contractors and HMRC. What the government did a couple of years ago was single out the authorities to say actually HMRC are no longer going to take risk on this and passing the risk to local authorities. So I think you are as well as quite right to raise it as a particular risk in local government and this transfer of risk from central to local government, uh, which in many cases has made uh, local authorities that bit more cautious around time of those family. Thank you. 
question. Well, just so yeah, I'm sorry. Well, other people might be on the same uh, you know, trade as you. Rob? Yeah, just on, on the lines of, of Andrew. Andrew. Um, I, I'm actually, I'm not really good at what's being discussed. I would like to have a slight of it, but I would also be concerned with cash flows and documents that I, I'm not going to produce to see comms, plans, and stuff like that, the stars are easier. So I don't know, but if there's disadvantage, if there's information, it should be shared with all. So we can actually all evaluate what's being discussed. It's an ethical argument. Well, it's, it's, if it's if it's the interest of this committee, should, should we share it amongst the committee? Well, <laughs> well um, what we did was look into the matter with some interest. If, if you were to speak to Kevin, I'm sure he'd give you all of this stuff all points you were the FOI response. I agree it would have been really nice if given the FOI, we all as members of this committee Jeff, I give away about this. I think we are going off a bit of a tangent here. Mark, would you like oh, to... No, you responded to all. Well, well, I, I would like Mark to comment on what's been said so far. The additional work that mm -hmm. Council alludes to there will be incorporated within two and specific two pieces of work that we've commissioned right. here, and there will be specific reference made to um, well, and whether or not the appointments have been changed. I thought that's what, what you were asking for, Jerry. No, I, I think, you know, begging Phil's palm around this, I know a lot of, I've dealt with a lot of contractors over the, over the, over the years, professionally and otherwise, and they will, um, they will, all of them say how much they hate I am 35 to a person, um, but they will also find ways of going through some of these umbrella companies and agencies and so on. All ticket costs I accept as another reason why contractors don't like them, but invariably it's about suggesting that they are a company and that we're buying a service. So I understand we tend to go through matrix because we put that out there, but what I'm saying is I believe we should be if we're bringing in contractors, we can bring in those people as interim post holders and that we should pay them through the payroll to make sure they pay absolutely the right amount of tax. And contractors will tell you, oh, but you don't understand, we've got to pay for this and the rest of it. But that should be held within the tax. So I am saying something a little different other than, oh, we do it through matrix and we'll have a look at it. And I don't think it will go away and we'll end up carrying on as we are before. And the other point I'd like to make is uh, what Cher said, and thank her for her honesty, in terms of saying that the processes didn't actually work in that apparently no one updated. They were just a senior manager found out about this quite early on, well before the 24th, didn't bring it to her attention. So that would suggest, even with this report, and I know this report says everything's fine here, um, everyone did their job, no report and move on. But even what Cher's just said now suggests actually things didn't work properly. But we had to, through a question and answer session, find that out rather than be contained within the report mark. Okay, so, uh, so as I said, I do have some disappointment around this report and the recommendation seems to be very general Jeff, rather than being quite specific. Quite several times. No, I, 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 I think, think I've got to make a mark and to <laughs> come into it and then not agree with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The conclusion reached in the report was that there were three elements of the Council's internal process and procedures that were aware of. Validation chain of bank details, ensuring the supplier was arithmetically correct, and the bank registration was supported on the file. We're quite specific about those three elements. There are other elements of this whole process which are to follow, as I indicated earlier, there are some very detailed, comprehensive pieces of work on the way in which we, the outcome which will be reported back to its commission is not in that detail.
end of March. So that will be after the, the last committee of this one. Uh, the next committee meeting is June this year. Phil, of course. Ben, Phil. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just a comment on the I-35 and K-1. So, for example, uh, umbrella companies actually aren't used if they're on I-35, they're an essential element of I-35, because that way uh, it's uh, the way that the council assures itself that proper tax and so forth is paid, because that's done through an umbrella company, while the land has contractor status, which is usually through a private uh, personal service company, uh, with all the application of company law and company tax, rather than personal tax. Uh, so they go down, down those two different routes. Uh, as I say, there is further work to do because there will be particular issues with going out to the market for specialist individual contractors or locals uh, and then taking them on payroll. Because taking them on payroll uh, brings in, uh, to, for them, uh, the potential for uh, direct employee status to be claimed, which isn't something they or the council want. Uh, but more particularly, because they are short-term, high-risk uh, experts, they are charging a market <coughs> rate, and that market rate will be quite different to what you would pay a full-time uh, employee. And therefore, that immediately brings in um, equal pay issues, because you could actually be um, paying two, effectively two employees sitting next to each other for the same kind of role, one permanent, one a locum, but one being paid significantly more than the other. Now that's because they're a locum and they're taking the risk uh, that the council can say, actually, we're giving you two hours notice, we don't want you anymore. Uh, so it's a very different relationship, which is why I say that needs further work. Uh, and you need advice from uh, HR and the contract folk uh, to explain how these various arrangements, both tax rules and employment rules, mesh together, uh, enabling what is a much smaller council than it used to, but in any event, we've always lived in a mixed economy where there needs to be locums and there needs to be experts for short-term pieces of work. Uh, so, um, can I encourage the, the committee that uh, if we're going to take that route to get that piece of advice before uh, making any further recommendations? Phil, mm. Bill, Bill, Kathy. Conscious that on the telly at the moment there's an advert where somebody tells you how to do your tax, and some bloke says shoeboxes and invoices. And I'm living in the world of shoeboxes and invoices, I'm afraid. Um, Sounds like the councillors do. Yes, I can. We might not buy some petrol for the wrong one. The issue is this question of continuity. I'm trying not to discuss a particular individual, but here we have somebody who's paid £180,000 in 12 months. The whole succession of times when that uh, I asked for a regular list of who are interims and consultants. Mr. Sator and his staff supply me every now and again. I issue all reminders now and again. So, who have we got now? Because some come and go, some insurance services have been necessary to cover gaps for some time. Here we have a particular businessman who spent some considerable time with us. Um, and the office mentioned the mention issue, issue of risk. Uh, we got to a stage where I suppose because they have been on a particular growth pattern, a particular set of work, that this was said to be the only gentleman we can go to really in South near and one we know. So we had much without him. Yeah, quite. Thank you, Jeff. So we ended up being really being trapped, if appropriate word, by one particular businessman who makes claims as to what he can do for us. And I'm not going to comment on what was or wasn't done. I didn't think because we needed the gentleman's advice in a number of um, key projects, there was a considerable reliance on this service provided by him. Now, if the gentleman was only working for us um, and his payments were going into a certain account, and then suddenly they don't appear in a certain account because the details are wrong. Then I, um, if somebody paid me from a, a job and it bounced or didn't appear in my account, then I have to go back to them and say, I haven't had any money this month because 
up to say I can track someone to the people. So, so if I haven't had it, I would be on to the employer or the person who's um, provided this long history of work over a long time and say, I haven't been paid this month, what's gone wrong? Now, I don't see the evidence for that. As I see in section 418 on page 16, is um, a very careful description about continuing to quote the previous company name or corresponds to the council so as not to declare that the Forge House Associates Limited is dissolved. Now, it must be officers, I know what, when writing reports, officers produce drafts and then look at them and say, I must get this right, I must get the phraseology right, and sometimes you know, things are carefully written. And in this particular one, I read into that that there's a clear intention not to declare that Forge House Associates Limited is dissolved, which raises more suspicions. When the meeting started, I referred to my trail of emails with the chief executive and officers, uh, which I haven't published, but went on for a year or so asking, was this, because I copied two team members who were hopefully read them, was this gentleman taken on? Did we check his history? What is all this about something that's happened in York that went to the York's audit committee? I studied York's audit committee minutes and sent extracts from York's audit committee minutes to officers and said, have you read this? Eventually got emails saying we've got quite big. We've asked York's chief executive about it, but we think it's all right. So there's a series of things going on here, and Mr. Nibok says there'll be a further report which I hope will cover that issue as to whether we were duly diligent. But I want to just deal with what Jeff said about all members. I said, when's our next meeting? After, could be after Perth, it could be July. I think this is too a serious an issue to kick down the road to after the period. And I'd like us to have a special meeting before Perth with the updated information that's available to officers. That's absolutely And I'll be happy next. Um, yes. um, right. First of all, just one query initially. Um, what was the rationale in changing um, the payment to Mr. Halliday from the Matrix Recruitment Agency to Four Chance Associates? What was the rationale in that? Um, did he request it? He did. Um, the other thing is, um, again, the um, Phil and Jeff both said, uh, this, the, the issue in my mind should have been brought to the attention of senior officers, not just on the 16th of January, but going back to October. Because it was on the October invoice that um, a young lady, a young gentleman who was in the department, noticed, and as um, Mr. Lindbock has quite clearly stated, there were three things that they would look for. And that was all done satisfactorily, except of course it came to here, and the other, I think he's a good noticed, that um, the VAT number was not on the invoice. So, issue number one, there's no VAT number on the invoice. Now, I would have thought that if Mr. Halliday and Forge Associates Limited would have had um, letterheads with a printed and that would have gone through something like Sage, Sage Accounting or some kind of payroll system, some kind of accounting system, which would have had the VAT number on the invoice. Also, made sure that that would not have been raised twice on the invoice. The system wouldn't allow it. So, the issue is that in October, a couple of things happened. One was that number was missed, another one was that um, that was issued twice. And in my view, and then they changed both details now. Changing the bank details would not necessarily raise any queries, so that can happen all the time. But if you have a combination of changing bank details, an invoice raised with no VAT number on, and an invoice raised with VAT on twice, that should ring the wrong bells. And so for me, the investigation into this company should have started in November, sorry, October. And then we go on to have a look at, oh, on the 16th of January, um, the principal tax manager email the VAT office on the 16th of January, and that's the time of the operations and development teams. On the 16th of January, these things were coming to light. 
And of course, somebody somewhere, and this, well, slightly somewhere, the ship was hitting the fan between October and January. And somebody should have told uh, Cher or somebody what was happening. And so on the 16th of January, um, the Inland Revenue or Major World, or the Principal Tax Manager, knows that, oh heck, we have uh, reported to the Inland Revenue claiming VAT on invoices, on dodgy invoices, no VAT on. So basically, Wilbur Council have uh, claimed VAT from HMRC and Mr. Halliday and um, Liz, I don't know, it's Liz Stead. She must have known when she realised that the October invoice wasn't paid because there was no VAT on it and that then it was subsequently rejected because she put VAT on twice. So unless she's a complete dilly, she should have known that that should have been picked up and somebody else in the local council should have picked it up. And so we go on then and the council realise that they have erroneously claimed all these months of VAT from HMRC knowing that it was, it was an incorrect VAT number on the invoices, that that VAT was not paid over to HMRC. And then, taking into consideration all of this, my own, my own view is, Chair, that I understand that you were told, and I'm sure that could happen. But, this is a very serious allegation, because we are now looking at the Board Council as you know, being schooled by HMRC, that, which is what they will do if something like this comes tonight. And so then you look at the fact that on the 24th of January, the uh, senior officer of the council is taking on somebody where all this has happened. Now, in my view, if there isn't a senior officer in this company, in this Royal Council, that does not think it's important to shove this up the line as quickly as possible then they really ought to be in their job, is my view. Secondly, when we go on uh, on section 428, it was found that Stuart Halliday does not have responsibility for a budget or has access to the iron procurement system and therefore does not have the authority or the responsibility for raising purchase orders or authorising invoices for payment. So presumably in January we change over from the other matrix recruitment to invoicing through Forge Associates uh, and he sets up a new, there's a new procurement set up, then Rubber Council will issue him with a purchase order number, presumably for about the whole year or part up to the, the financial year, with a, a PO number and an amount on it that it will, will specify how much he can spend. So that's the other issue. How was it determined? how much a month or a year he could invoice. So was he doing a specific thing every month so the invoice should be the same every month, so the PO number should have been X amount divided by 12 months, so for the total year he'd have a drawdown on it. And if it wasn't, so he'd have to request a PO number presumably each month for an amount, and somebody would have to say that's okay, he can have that amount if it's your PO number and sign it off. Then on 428, because it doesn't have a responsibility for the budget or anything else. And yet on 429, it says it was identified that Stuart Halliday signed a number of invoices to evidence that the goods or services were provided. That's like marking your own work at school, isn't it? Oh, yes, sir, I got 10 out of 10, actually, I got one more, but you. So, he, so he's signing off invoices to evidence that the goods and services that he's provided have been provided, which would then lead to an officer to receive the goods and services on the iron procurement system. So, um, and then it says, see, and it's qualified for details of the payments made after the 25th of September. So, 